Hello, my name is Peter Galle. I'm head of the first department of internal medicine at Mainz University Hospital. This um, clinic harbors the uh, department of hepatology, which is our uh, most important department. We are having a focus on hepatocellular carcinoma, liver transplantation, and autoimmune liver disease. In numbers, we are transplanting roughly 60 patients per year and on an outpatient basis see roughly 5,000 patients per year. Today we would like to present a case with hepatocellular carcinoma. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Werns on my left-hand side and Dr. Förster, who are going to present the case. Our case today is about a 51-year-old female patient who has a history of former IV drug abuse, which she stopped in November 2011, and a chronic hepatitis C virus infection, genotype 3A, which was diagnosed in 1990. She has not received any antiviral treatment so far, and she shows no clinical signs of liver cirrhosis. Currently, she's taking part in a methadone substitution program. We enrolled her in our HCC surveillance program at our clinic, uh, despite the lacking of uh, clinical signs of liver cirrhosis because of the uh, long duration of her HCV infection. In August 2012, uh, she had an ultrasound which was inconspicuous. However, her AFP levels increased to above 20,000. As a consequence, we performed a CT scan which showed a hardly distinguishable hypervascularized lesion of at least four centimeters in diameter in the right caudal liver lobe and suspected thrombosis of the right portal vein main branch. How did we start treating our patient? When we talk about treatment, we first have to introduce the BCLC classification. The BCLC classification was introduced in 1999 by the Barcelona group and uh, according to the patient's performance status, tumor burden and liver function, you can uh, divide the patient into five um, stages. The very early and early stage, which is for potentially curative approaches such as surgical resection or liver transplant, the intermediate stage for <coughs> transarterial approaches such as uh, transarterial chemoembolization, the advanced stage for systemic treatment, particularly sorafenib at this time, and in the end stage, you should not provide any specific oncological treatment um, to the patient. In our case, um, our patient was in a very good uh, um, co clinical condition. She had normal liver function, no sign of liver cirrhosis or portal hypertension. She had a solitary tumor, and so we decided um, that she is more in, um, in an early stage than in an advanced stage, uh, despite the suspicion of macrovascular invasion. So we um, recommended her a surgical resection. Why did you not consider a liver transplantation for her? Yeah, that's a good question. There are um, main, uh, two main points we have to discuss. The first one, uh, the patient has no signs of liver cirrhosis. And what is uh, most important, um, the, suspicious, the suspicion of um, macrovascular invasion, uh, it's the main reason why she was not a candidate for liver transplant. Our patient received a right-sided hemihepatectomy in September 2012 and the histology showed a moderately differentiated HCC with macroscopic vascular invasion measuring about 8 centimeters in diameter. In addition, the histology showed portal fibrosis with beginning sept formation confirming that this HCC had occurred in a liver without cirrhosis. The final TNM staging of the tumor was PT2 without lymph node or distant metastasis, and the HCC had been resected R0. Now, this has obviously been a nice surgical result. What about adjuvant treatment in such a situation? Mm. Yeah, this is a very uh, good question and a crucial point. Uh, the central problem after surgical resection uh, is the high rate of uh, recurrence, uh, up to 70% in five years. We roughly distinguish between early recurrence due to microscopic uh, spread uh, during the first two years, and later there is um, 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 a late recurrence due to the persisting underlying liver disease. 
And so an adjuvant treatment uh, would be very helpful in this settlement. However, you have to keep in mind that we are in 2012. So uh, what about the use of sorafenib? At this time point, the STORM trial uh, was uh, fully recruited. The STORM trial was a uh, phase three randomized controlled trial uh, evaluating um, the use of sorafenib in the adjuvant setting after surgical resection or local ablation. Uh, however, um, in the meantime, uh, the results are published and uh, it's clear that there is no benefit from sorafenib in this setting, neither uh, to the recurrence-free survival nor um, to the overall survival. Apart from this, uh, our patient uh, mm, mm, did not fulfill the inclusion criteria of the STORM trial due to the tumor burden. And regarding an HCV treatment, uh, we have to state uh, that our patient uh, was not eligible for an interferon-based regimen um, due to her mental status. So we, we had to wait um, for the advent of the direct acti uh, antivirals. However, I think you are familiar with the situation uh, and there is a controversial debate um, regarding the use of uh, DAA treatment after surgical resection, also reflected by a huge amount of abstract um, at this uh, International Liver Congress. <coughs> Our patient attended regular follow-ups at our clinic at three months intervals, which is the standard practice for uh, patients who have received hepatic resection during the first year afterwards. And the CT scan in May 2013 showed suspected multifocal HCC recurrence with multiple hypervascularized lesions and one enlarged lymph node near the lesser gastric curvature. How did you treat our patient next? Yeah, we have three potential settings. Of course, we can repeat surgical resection um, because she had a, a normal liver and no signs of cirrhosis. However, this is not a good option, not due to the, the enlarged lymph node. Uh, we think it's uh, related to the chronic HCV infection most likely. However, the, the recurrence was too fast, so uh, surgical resection is not a good option. So we can go for transuterial approaches, we can discuss the use of TACE or radioembolization. However, we also can, can go for sorafenib. And however, at this time point, I think we have again talk about the stage of the disease of our patient. She had now a progression to intermediate stage, it's a multifocal disease. However, without extrahepatic spread, again the lymph node is not suspicious uh, in our mind. And so what, what do the guidelines recommend in this stage? And this is transuterial chemoembolization. So we performed four times taste with drug eluting beads very selectively from July to December 2013. And from radiological point of view, we had a stable disease according to RESIST, however, with a partial devascularization of previously known lesion. I think it's important <coughs> that stable disease according to, to resist should not be considered um, as a success. Yeah, it's more, more than a treatment failure. However, I think the partial devascularization um, in the end leads uh, to, a, to a good result in this case. Okay. However, after four TACE sessions, the CT scan in January 2014 showed growth of liver mm. lesions with a revascularization of formerly devascularized parts. However, there was no sign of extra hepatic spread, so our patient remained in the BCLCB stage. In addition, there was a strong increase in her AFP level. How did you treat our patient mm. next? Okay. At this time, again, we have to talk uh, about the stage of the disease. Of course, the patient uh, suffered from a progression under TACE. However, she did not progress to the next stage. And in such a context, international guidelines recommend the concept of a treatment stage migration. That means you can use uh, the recommended treatment of a later stage in an earlier stage. So we can use sorafenib or another systemic treatment in the intermediate stage. And that's what we did. Yeah, we put the patient on sorafenib treatment. Okay. At this point, we would like to make a few general remarks regarding the use of TACE in the management of HCC. From a clinical perspective, there has been the impression that the majority of 
patients who do not qualify for curative treatments receive TACE. And this was confirmed by the BRIDGE trial, uh, which was a large longitudinal study and which assessed the management of HCC in real life and showed that patients with intermediate HCC receive TACE in 60% of the cases and about 50% of patients with advanced HCC also receive TACE. So this suggests an overutilization of TACE, especially in the advanced stage. Now, two studies from uh, 2013 showed that only a small fraction of patients who have received transarterial therapies um, receive systemic agents or enter clinical trials upon disease progression. The reason for this is that TACE can lead to uh, the deterioration of liver function as a side effect. And the deterioration of liver function precludes these patients from systemic treatment. And therefore, it is necessary to re-evaluate the patient's condition after each TACE session uh, whether he, he, he or she still qualifies for TACE or whether he or she should be put on a systemic agent which would currently be sorafenib. This is very important um, and the switch should be performed early before the liver function is impaired. Yeah, very good point. But uh, back to our uh, patient. We started sorafenib in February 2014 um, she received a standard dose, that means 400 mg uh, twice daily and not unexpectedly she suffered from some side effects. She had some skin toxicity, particularly hand foot skin syndrome, weight loss, fatigue, however other potential side effects such as diarrhea or arterial hypertension did uh, not occur. And how did you manage these side effects? Mm. Did you continue with sorafenib as before, or did you reduce the dose, or mm -hmm. did you stop sorafenib entirely? Yeah, good point. Uh, we know uh, already from other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that some side effects, particularly skin uh, and dermatologic events, uh, are surrogate parameters uh, for improved uh, survival. And it was nicely shown some years ago that early skin toxicity related to sorafenib um, leads to a longer survival, uh, as shown in this picture. And so we wanted to keep the patient on sorafenib as long as possible. So what did we do? We uh, did a consequent uh, uh, reduction of sorafenib to 200 milligram uh, twice daily and temporarily even one tablet a day. And as a consequence, we had an acceptable toxicity and clinical stabilization and from an allergological point of view, a partial response according to modified resist uh, lasting for, for about 10 months. However, then, uh, in um, January 2015, uh, we have to state that we have progressive disease yeah, due to an increasing revascularization of several lesions in the, in the disease scan. How did you deal <coughs> with this disease progression? Mm. Did you continue with sorafenib as in a treatment beyond progression or did you change to second line treatment mm. option? Yeah, this is an uh, important point in, in, uh, in the clinical setting. We know now that there are different types of radiological uh, progression uh, can affect the overall survival differently. Uh, it's, um, um, an intrahepatic progression is better than extrahepatic progression. However, new extrahepatic lesions are worse than the growth of existing extrahepatic lesion. Back to our patient, we have to, to, to state that she only has an intrahepatic uh, growth of existing lesion, so we decided uh, to, to treat her with sorafenib beyond radiological progression. And as you can see in this slide, uh, it was um, the, right, the right choice. This is the level of AFP over time, and you can see it dramatically drop down and then uh, stable AFP level for over two years. We have to say our patient is now five years after the initial diagnosis of the HCC. She lives, uh, she still is, is alive, and her time on sorafenib is more than three years. No. Uh, do you have an explanation why our patient responded so exceptionally well mm. to sorafenib? Mm -hmm. One potential explanation is, of course, the etiology of the underlying liver disease. Uh, this is a um, 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 
very recent meta-analysis published uh, in the GCO um, uh, related to three randomized control trials in the first line setting where um, sunitinib, privernib, or linifernib were, were compared to uh, sorafenib. And what, what the authors could show that um, um, particular patients with HCV infection benefit most from sorafenib treatment. So our patient has an HCV infection. This could be a good explanation why she benefits so much uh, from the drug. However, it may become necessary to discontinue sorafenib this is when marked radiological and clinical disease progression occur, as in new extrahepatic disease manifestation or increase in size of lesions without necrosis or a marked AFP increase. In addition, intolerable toxicity um, and a deterioration of liver function or in some cases the availability of clinical trials can be reasons for discontinuing sorafenib. Now, our patient <coughs> has been on uh, sorafenib for quite some time, mm -hmm. and the time may have come uh, for her to stop treatment with sorafenib since she has had mm -hmm. an upward trend in her AFP levels recently. What second-line treatment options would you consider for mm -hmm. her? Yeah, I think at this time point we have uh, a lot of treatment options. Yeah? We know from the resource trial that regonorafenib is a uh, real good option for patients. Uh, after sorafenib failure, particularly in patients uh, who tolerated the drug. Um, in addition, we have uh, nivolumab off-label um, uh, as an option. We have uh, positive results from a phase two trial uh, showing impressive um, objective response rates, about 20%, uh, never seen before in HCC. And of course, we can include the patients in several uh, clinical phase three trials. Uh, there is another uh, PD-1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab, in the second line setting. There is ramucirumab, a uh, VHFR2 inhibitor, also evaluated in the second line setting after zoravenib failure. And we can, can include here into the, uh, the carbozantinib trial. This is a combined VHFR um, MET inhibitor, also in the second line setting. I think we can now offer the patient more option uh, at this time point than during the years before. And with this positive outlook, we have come to the end of our case. We hope you have enjoyed it and learned something new about the management of HCC. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.